Around the world, the last great message of the Creator is being carried with the mighty power of His enabling spirit. Millions in Russia, America, Africa, Australia, and 200 other countries are saying yes to Christ, where the people once languished in the valley of the shadow of death. The light of the everlasting gospel is now shining. John and Beverly Carter, whose calling has led them to minister in many countries, now invite you to join them for an exciting hour of discovery. As the Word of God brings hope in despair, light in darkness, meaning in confusion, joy in sorrow, and life in death. Today I'm going to answer the question, is it possible for the living to talk to the dead? And can our dead loved ones come back and talk to us? But before I do so, I'm pleased to introduce my wife, Beverly, who has an important message for us today. In a recent Time magazine, I read something that quite honestly disturbed me. It was a description of the latest family comedy shows on television. The article said, the non-normal or non-traditional family has become the norm in the new family comedies. Gone are the days of the Huxtables and the little house on the prairie. These new so-called family shows present so many alternative lifestyles, one is left wondering what is normal anymore? What does a parent do if you find your children watching one of these kind of shows? I like what a young friend of mine did. She quietly and calmly turned the television off and then told her children why it wasn't good or safe to watch that particular program. She also told them the importance of never hating people who think or live differently to them. I think that was a wise mother, don't you? Who were our first parents? Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Steve and not Sally and Eve. By the way, why did God make Eve last? He didn't want any advice while creating Adam. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> so God gave us the blueprint of his ideal family unit right there in the Garden of Eden. Did you know that was one of the reasons Eve was created? God worried that Adam would always be lost in the garden because men hate to ask for directions. Yes, the family was important then and is still the most fundamental unit of society. However, God's blueprint is being attacked. And I hear people say, if everybody is doing it, and it never is everybody, it just seems that way, then it must be okay or the norm. For example, if everyone is shacking up, living together without getting married, then that must now be a normal family. Another group has voiced the opinion that same gender unions should be accepted as an alternative family unit. And here I would like to answer a question that came in from a young person. The young person asks, what answer or reason do I give my friends for not believing in same gender marriages? I would like to suggest this. The book of Genesis says that marriage and family is the oldest institution in the world as God made and blessed it on the Friday of creation. The Bible clearly teaches that this family was, unit was made up of one male and one female. One reason God needs two genders is because he needs both male and female to represent and demonstrate his parenting attributes. For instance, a little boy needs his daddy to teach and show him how to become a man and how to relate to women. 
A little boy also needs a good relationship with his mother to learn how to communicate and treat women. A little girl needs her mummy to teach and show her how to become a lady and how to relate to men. A girl also needs a good relationship with her father to learn how to communicate and treat men. That is God's ideal. But sadly, we all know we don't live in an ideal world and none of us are perfect. Special recognition should be given to single parents who despite the odds are doing their utmost to provide a good home. These parents need special help and support from the, from the church family. The family is like a book. The children are the leaves. The parents are the covers that protective beauty gives. At first, the pages of the book are blank and pure and fair, but time soon writes its memories and paints its pictures there. Love is the little golden clasp that bindeth up the trust. Oh, break it not, lest all the leaves shall scatter and be lost. The Apostle Paul wrote, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. God help us to keep the children safe. We're very glad today to welcome you to the Carter Report. This is one of the most important meetings in the series. Today, I'm going to talk about the state of the dead. Where are the dead? Is it important to know this? Tremendously important. Why? because of all the different points of view and the different religions. Just down the road we have our friends, the Mormons, in fact, right next to us. The Mormons believe that Joseph Smith, who they believe was a prophet, was contacted by John the Baptist. Their whole faith is based upon the doctrine that the dead are alive. All of Mormonism we have some wonderful friends in the Mormon faith. They believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, and they believe that this was demonstrated when John the Baptist, a dead man, came and spoke to their prophet. Then, of course, we think of our wonderful friends in the great Roman Catholic Church. They believe in the immortality of the soul. They believe in the communion of the saints, not only here, in the church down here, but they believe that there's a church up in heaven, not talking about the angels, but talking about the spirits of the dead. And they believe that dead people come back and speak to people here in this world. For instance, while the Pope was recovering from his close assassination attempt, he believes that the Blessed Virgin Mary came to him and talked to him and told him what he needed to do to bring the world together. So the Roman Catholic Church believes that the dead are alive, that the dead saints, St. Peter, St. Paul, and the Blessed Virgin Mary are alive and they come back and they talk to people. Then there is the New Age movement everywhere in America, particularly here in Southern California. The New Age movement is based on the idea that we all have immortal souls and that after death, the spirit lives on, the soul lives on, and that the souls of great people come back and they talk to people here in this world. And they will tell you, the people in the New Age, that they have received their information from the spirits of the living dead. So everybody is tied up somehow or the other. Then, of course, there is the old-fashioned spiritism, where people go to a seance and the medium calls up a dead person, a dead relative, and the relative comes and does some talking. Then, I guess the most popular religion just down the road from us in Hollywood is Scientology. Many of the stars, many of the famous stars who put out these dreadful movies are up to here in Scientology. What is Scientology? It is spiritism. Scientology is based on the belief that millions and millions of years ago, 
their founder said trillions of years ago, they were all of these demigods or eternal spirits. And they became bored with the concept of eternity. What do you do after the first 10 billion years? So they got so bored that they rebelled. Hey, I wonder where he got this from with a twist. And so a large number of these spirits rebelled and they came down to this earth and they inhabit human bodies. These are eternal souls. And when our body dies, then the spirit hops into another body and it goes on and on and on. And thus you can somehow work your way up and you can become like God. And the real God is the God within you. And the leaders of Scientology will tell you how you can become a super person by paying a super fee. One of the fees to get rid of these terrible demons that are clinging to your flesh is $200,000. It is a wonderful business, of course, it's been outlawed in many parts of the world. But it is based on the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. And if I can mention too about our wonderful friends in the Mormon church, they believe in the immortality of the soul and they believe for what man is now, God once was. And what we are now, we can become one day the same as God. And we can, every one of us, we can become Yahweh Elohim, we can become the Almighty God. And it is done through this belief in the immortality of the soul because the soul doesn't die, but it is passed on from generation to generation and a person eventually becomes God. Let me warn you about something. There is no more, in quotes, dangerous subject and the subject of spiritism when you deal with it. If you are tied up in any of these religions that has a tie-in with spiritism, it's going to be almost impossible to reach you because of the overwhelming influence of spiritism. It can be done through a greater spirit, and that is the spirit of the living God. But there's something that we all must recognize and accept today that there's only one authority to find truth and that is the Bible. Not the Book of Mormon, not the writings of some prophet, not the writings of the leaders of Scientology, none of those things. My authority is the Scriptures. I want you to take your Bible now and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19 and 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19 and 20. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Some people say, why do you use the New International Version? Why don't you use the old King James Version? I do use the King James Version. It is the Bible of my mother church, the Church of England. And it was translated, as you know, in 1611. It is a wonderful translation. And so is the New International Version. There are many, many wonderful versions. And we should not quarrel over what version you're going to use. What we should do is to get people read any, to read any version they've got. Because it is still the Word of God. Please notice Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. As the King James Version says, if they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Now today, we're going to use a tried and wonderful method of discovering truth. And this is the method of simply asking questions and receiving answers from the Bible. And the first question we need to ask and answer is this, and I want to say this to my Mormon friends, my Roman Catholic friends, my friends in Scientology, 
all those people who are mixed up in spiritism in one form or the other, here is the question, does man have an immortal soul? How a person answers that will determine what he believes. Does a person have an immortal soul? It is an interesting thing to discover this, that all of the great religions in the world, the ancient Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians with their pyramids, the Greeks, the Romans, the Roman Catholics, the vast number of Protestants, the Buddhists, the Hindus, people in Scientology and Mormonism, all the great religions in the world believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul with one exception. One exception. And that exception is the religion of the Bible. The Bible does not believe in the immortality of the soul. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me now to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 14 to 16. And there are Bibles in the seats in the front and I want you to see this. It's important that you turn to these texts. When I have people come to my meetings, if I can get them to turn to the Bible, I know that there is wonderful hope for them. But if I cannot get people to turn to the Bible, I know that they are sitting ducks for deception. So please turn to the text. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 14 to 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 14 to 16. The Bible says, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal. My friend, that should settle it. I should not need to turn to another passage. Let me write it up here on the blackboard. The Bible tells me these are not my words. These are the words of the inspired apostle. The Bible says God alone. That means by himself, nobody else. God alone is immortal. Therefore, if God alone is immortal, the teaching of, teachings of Scientology are false because there are not immortal souls and there are not immortal spirits. I want to put it to you. I appeal to you. How can a person say, I have an immortal soul, something in me which cannot die, as say my friends, the Mormons, as say my friends, the Roman Catholics, how can a person argue like this when the Bible says God alone is immortal? I do not believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul because the Bible says God alone is immortal. That is the teaching of the word. And when I turn to other passages in the Bible such as I find in the New Testament and in the Old Testament and particularly in the ancient book of Job, I read the words, for instance, in Job 4.17, man is mortal. These are the words that describe you and me. The Bible says we are mortal and God alone is immortal. You say to me, but you are confusing me. No. I am not confusing you. I hope I am showing you the unconfused truth. I ask you simply to, with an open mind to consider the evidence. Now the Bible tells us that we are mortal, but one day we are going to get immortality. First Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 54 is the passage. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. 
and it tells us when we get immortality. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal, and the mortal, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The Bible tells us that God's people get the gift of immortality one day. So immortality is given as a gift in reality. The Bible says when Jesus Christ comes back and the dead are raised. The Bible says this mortal, but if you have an immortal soul, how could the Bible say this mortal if you are immortal? The Bible says this mortal, that is us, one day God is going to clothe us with immortality. Therefore, if we are going to get immortality when Jesus comes, it is proof that we don't have it now. It is proof that the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is nowhere taught in the Word of God. What is the soul? People say, many theologians have said, but less are saying it today. For instance, the doctrine that because we have an immortal soul, man is going to be tormented through all eternity, burn and burn and burn and burn for millions of years, is going out the window and into the trash heap of history. It is being relegated there by no less people than preachers like Billy Graham. Billy that red-hot evangelist doesn't believe in, the, in eternal torment? No. He says he thinks he was wrong. Well, if he was wrong on that, he can only be wrong on that if he gets right on this. Because if you have an immortal soul and if it goes into fire, then of course it's going to live for all eternity and burn 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 with screaming and crying. What sort of God is that? As one man said, then God's the devil. It's true. What is the soul? Well, people say, this is a body, and the body is a shell, and inside the body there is a, a thing that cannot die. It is the soul. The Bible talks in the Old Te Testament about nefesh kaya, a living soul. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 7, the Lord God formed man, you can turn to it, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. We are made out of dust. We come from dust, we go to dust. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You are a living soul. It is not as one great evangelist preached. I heard him preach. The Lord God, he said, for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a living soul. It doesn't say that. It says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. This is what the Bible says. Genesis 2, 7, the book of beginnings that talks about the creation of the human race. The Lord God took the earth, E-A-R, the dust of the earth and breathed into that body that was made by the hands of a loving creator out of clay, breathed into that person the breath of life, which is the spirit, the ruach. He breathed into the body, the ruach, the spirit, the spirit of life that came from God. 
And the Bible says that became a living soul. You are a soul. But you are not innately immortal. The Bible says in Ezekiel, you can write this down in your notes, Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. The soul that sins, that soul will die. It says that Ezekiel, you can notice it in your own Bible. I'm going to write this up. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, have you ever tried to study the word of God with a person who's tied up with the new age or spiritism? I will tell you what happens when you take out a Bible and say, I want to show you these texts. They say, we don't want to see it. Don't show it to us. I have walked around a room with an open Bible pursuing a spiritist who would say, don't bring it near me. I don't want, to, don't want to see it because this book unmasks spiritism. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 says, The soul that sins will die. Therefore, the Bible says, the soul can die. And for those of you watching on television, get your Bibles and read it. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. The soul is not immortal. The soul dies. People say, this goes against popular theology. Yes, it does. Amen. Why? Because popular theology is wrong. And why are so many people sucked in? Because they don't read their Bibles. They don't study. Or else because their eyes are closed fast with tradition. They don't want to think about these things. They say, it's better not to know because what you don't know you won't be held guilty for. Let us be honest and discover the truth. Now the question is, if millions of people, we don't say any of these things in a derogatory sense, but if millions of people in, in Mormonism and Roman Catholicism and Hinduism and Protestantism and you can go on and on and on, Scientology, if they believe in this doctrine of the immortality of the soul, then the question is, where did it come from? Not where they think. Would you please come to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 which talks about the soul, the creation of man, and the great apostasy. Genesis, that is why I urge people to read their Bibles. I don't care whether you go to an Adventist church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church. I urge you to get your Bible. And when you come to these meetings, read your Bible. And when you go home every day, read your Bible for at least 30 minutes a day, preferably for an hour. Ezekiel, uh, come now, we've read the one in Ezekiel, now we're going to go to uh, Genesis 3, verses 1 and onwards. Where did the immortality of the soul come from? Now the serpent, tell me, who is this? This is His Majesty the devil. This great spirit that was made to stand in the presence of God as the covering angel. But he was not made immortal because the Bible says he's going to be destroyed in the last days. Now, if you look at Genesis 3, now the serpent was more crafty, cunning than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made, Yahweh Elohim had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. What did God tell the woman? If you break the holy law of God, something is going to happen to you. What is it? 
you're going to die. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. You must not eat fruit from any tree in the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Every man can become a God in his own right. That's what Scientology teaches. Every man can progress to the place where he is a God with many, many wives and can populate his own universe, says Mormonism. Where does it all go back? To the serpent. You will not surely die but your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods the doctrine of the immortality of the soul goes back to the devil it was taught particularly by the Greeks who taught that the body was a shell much of religious talk today is simply Greek in origin, we got it from Socrates or Plato or somebody else. The Greeks taught that the body was a shell that encased an immortal soul. And when Socrates is about to drink the fatal hemlock, his, di his disciples are discouraged and they say, Master, do not drink the fatal hemlock. He says, I will do so because the body dies, but the soul lives forever and goes to a place of paradise. It came, passed down to the Romans, and the Romans gave it to the Roman Catholics, and the Catholics gave it to the Protestant world. And vast numbers of people today are swimming in a lake that is called Spiritism because they have not had the truth preached to them from the pulpit and because they have been too indifferent to investigate for themselves. The soul that sins will die. Where do the dead go at death? Where is my father, for instance? Where are the dead? Where is the Blessed Virgin Mary? Where is Saint Peter? Where is Saint Paul? Where is John the Baptist? Please notice Acts 2, verse 29. Acts in the New Testament. Please turn to the passages. I say it again. Please turn Acts 2 and verse 29 and 34. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. Verse 34. Verse 34. For David did not ascend to heaven. Goodness. The Bible tells us very plainly that this great saint, David, is not in heaven. It says that. These are the very words of Scripture. The Bible says, everybody says he is in heaven. The Blessed Virgin Mary is in heaven. Saint Peter is in heaven. John the Baptist is in heaven. No. The Bible says they're not. Where are they? The Bible says that the dead are sleeping in the grave awaiting the blessed call from the blessed Lord. They're awaiting the resurrection. Therefore, if John the Baptist is unconscious and sleeping in the grave, as the Bible teaches, then who was the being who appeared to Joseph Smith? Certainly not the prophet, but the old liar the devil. And in Scientology, when they talk about these spirits that inhabit our bodies, who has told them this? The old liar. And when we say with reverence or re with respect, rather, the Pope who says, I have been talking to the Blessed Virgin Mary and she has this plan for the world, for the new millennium. And he goes forth with passion and courage 
as the ambassador of the one true holy Catholic Church as he sees it, then where does his authority come from? Not the Blessed Virgin Mary, but from the person who said you will not die. Who are these beings in the seance chamber? They are not the spirits of the dead, but the spirits of deceiving angels. Very important. The dead are sleeping in the grave. Now some people will come to me and they'll say, but haven't you heard where Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ? Yes, I do, too. He said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. When a person dies, he falls asleep. There's no consciousness, no awareness of the passing of time. And the next thing he knows is the resurrection. So as far as he is concerned, he goes into the very presence of God. As far as he is concerned, but not as far as reality is concerned. Others say, don't you know the Bible says, absent from the body and present with the Lord, and we have a building that's prepared by God in heaven. Of course, I know this. And the Bible says, I'm going to get this new body at the second coming, not at death. For this mortal must put on immortality at the second coming. All we need to do is to read all the texts, not get hung up on one text. I'm reminded of the writings over the old blacksmith's door. All kinds of twistings and turnings done here. That describes how many people do their Biblical study, twistings and turnings, but no exegesis of the texts of the Bible. Where are the dead? Come over here to John chapter 11, to the words of Jesus, our Lord. John chapter 11. This is talking about the death of a very good man. His name was Lazarus. John chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany and describes him. Verse 11 to 14. After he'd said this, he, Jesus, went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. These don't take it from me, take it from the words of our Lord. The Bible says, the dead, the dead, Jesus said it in John chapter 11, the dead are sleeping. And Jesus said, I'm going to go there and wake him up. And you can read in this chapter where he went to the tomb. They didn't want to take away the stone because the dead man had been there for four days. It was a hot climate. And they said, Lord, there will be an odor. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Jesus went to the stone and he he went to the tomb, the stone was gone, and he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Those who believe in the immortality of the soul say Lazarus wasn't in there, Lazarus was in heaven. You see, Jesus didn't believe what, common, what is commonly taught today. Jesus said Lazarus is in there. He didn't say, he didn't look up into the heavens and say, Lazarus, come on down. He didn't say, Lazarus, come on up from hell. Because there are no people in hell right now. Hell is a condition that exists at the very end of the time when God comes and destroys the world and makes it over again. But Jesus went to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, he who was dead, not the body, just the body, he who was dead came forth. You know where Lazarus was? He was in the grave. What was Lazarus doing? I was watching a great television program with a great television preacher who was adored by millions of people who don't read their Bibles, 
who sit there and who clap and who laugh and who go to church for the same reason that other people go to bars to get their kicks and their amusement. It's a social club. And here is this preacher, he's saying, Lazarus, Jesus went to the tomb and brought Lazarus out. And when Lazarus came out, oh, what stories he had to tell about what he saw, had seen in heaven. Nonsense. Lies. Lazarus was sleeping. The Bible says when Jesus comes back, he comes to awaken the dead. Isn't it confusing? You go to a funeral and the preacher says, our brother is up in heaven. He's looking down upon us. Have you ever gone to a funeral where the preacher has said, our brother is now enjoying hell? <laughs> but the Bible seems to indicate that the vast majority do not get to heaven. Why it is the path that leads to destruction? Many go there. Straight and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Therefore, if all we preachers were honest, we'd have to put the vast majority of the people we bury into hell. But nobody does that, of course. So we say, our departed brother is up in heaven and he's looking down upon us. Ooh. And then he goes on, he says, Now I want to comfort you with these words. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. First Thessalonians 4. And we say, he's in heaven, but God's going to come back to resurrect him. Why? It doesn't make sense. But then for some it doesn't need to make sense. The dead are unconscious. John the Baptist is asleep, unconscious. The Blessed Virgin Mary is not in heaven. St. Paul, on which the Catholic Church builds its cathedral, is not in heaven. Can I tell you the difference between the true church and the false church? The true church... Now let me take the false church first. The false church is built upon a dead sleeping saint. Unconscious. Impotent. But the true church is built upon a living saving Christ. That's the difference. Now Jesus is in heaven. And that's why Jesus is the mediator. How can Mary intercede when she's asleep? What about Mormonism? With all of these spirit beings inhabiting these bodies. John the Baptist talking to their prophet. Little wonder, my friend... They need another book besides this book to prove their doctrines. Little wonder that Scientology hates the Bible. Little wonder that spiritists will run around the room to get away from the Bible. Little wonder the New Age has visions and dreams. It doesn't teach people the book. The book unmasks the Antichrist. See? You better understand this subject. In fact, the Bible says that the dead don't know a thing. Would you come over here to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6? That's back in the Old Testament. Some people say, oh, I don't like a text out of the Old Testament. Well, learn to like it. Because, let me tell you why, it's the only Bible that Jesus ever had. Jesus didn't have any other Bible than the Old Testament. So don't throw away the Bible that Jesus had because it doesn't suit your theology. You better change your theology. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6, For the living know that they will die, but the dead... What does it say? Let me write it on the blackboard. Goodness me. 
The Bible says, the living know that they will die. We know of two things for certain. What are they? Taxes, taxes, and death. The Bible says, the dead, the Blessed Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, my father, the dead know nothing. Ecclesiastes 9, people say, but we don't want to hear that as the Old Testament. Why? Because it contradicts your cherished ideas? The Apostle Paul went out and preached. What do you think he preached from? The book of Romans or the book of Ephesians? Those books were still being written, goodness me. When those apostles went out and preached, they preached from the Old Testament. And they said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That is the Old Testament. The dead know nothing. What happens when a person dies? It says in Ecclesiastes, that the body goes to dust. The spirit returns to God who gave it. The spirit in that context is not the soul. It is the breath of life. God has placed that gift within me. And when a person dies, the body goes back to dust as we know. The breath goes to God and the person sleeps until the resurrection. The Bible says that all those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, but those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament and as the stars forever and ever. What about the dying thief? Ah, they say, We build our hope upon the dying thief. I would rather build my hope upon the living Jesus. But the dying thief, there he is. He calls to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me. And Jesus says unto him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. But our Lord didn't go to paradise that day because in John chapter 20, on the third day, on the Sunday when he was raised from the dead, he said to Mary, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. I think that's John 20, verse 19. You can read it there. The thief never went to heaven that day because a man would live on a cross for a week. That's why they broke his legs to put him up again on Saturday night. So how do we understand it? It's simply a case of punctuation. There are no punctuation marks in the Greek language. And when the translators came to this verse because they believed in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, they put the comma where it best suited their theology. And in the King James Version and other translations it says... Truly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. But that is not where the comma ought to be. The comma ought to be placed where the Bible says it should be. And what Jesus said was this, truly I say to you today, as I hang here upon this cross, In all my shame and nakedness, I am still Lord. Today, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. And he will be when Jesus comes. And so can you. And so, we ask the question or questions What are we going to do with John the Baptist and the Mormons? Recognize it was a delusion. The Pope talking to the Blessed Virgin Mary, a satanic delusion. And people in this great land of the United States, the latest statistics tell us 
that 65% of Americans believe they've had the, an experience with a dead person. 65% of you. Two-thirds. What are we going to do with these experiences? We are going to judge them by the word of God. And when they say unto you, these things are true because we've seen them, we will answer to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. And we will stand upon the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Now listen carefully. Spiritism is the strongest force in the universe apart from Christ. When a person gets caught up with it in any way, it's virtually impossible to break the bonds, except through a direct encounter with God. Our young people are being exposed to spiritism. The television industry reeks with spiritism. The television personalities are tied up in Scientology and all of these things. Spiritism. No other country in the world, except the United States of America, celebrates Halloween like this country. Halloween is spiritism. They spend more money now on Halloween than they do on Christmas. There is a movement away from the study of the Bible. You know why, can I appeal to you, why I just appeal to you folks to read your Bibles? Because the vast 99% of people who go to church in this country haven't got a clue what's inside the Bible. Haven't got a clue. I meet them. I talk to them all the time. They don't know. Haven't got a clue. It is not taught. The people get caught up in all types of ecstatic experiences. Talking in tongues, the holy laugh, sweeps millions and millions of people. They say, this is the proof that God must be with us because we have these experiences. The Bible says in the last days that there's a power that arises it's called the false prophet. And it describes what the false prophet does. It says the false prophet brings down fire from heaven on the earth and the side of men to deceive those into getting the mark of the beast. You know what this fire is that comes down from heaven? People say, that's the atom bomb. Come on. Can you remember two occasions? The false prophet. Who was the true prophet in the Old Testament who stood for Christ and truth? Elijah. Elijah. What did Elijah do? He brought down fire from heaven. So the true prophet brings down fire. The false prophet brings down fire. Can you think of another time when fire came down from heaven? Acts 2. Pentecost, tongues of fire, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the last days, the false prophet is going to have a counterfeit Pentecost. And it's going to be based on the immortality of the soul, messages from the dead, the appearing of saints, it's going to be on television. One of the greatest evangelists in the world who has an influence that reaches hundreds of millions said, soon Jesus is going to appear with him on television. Do you know what's going to happen? People are going to believe it. I watched those vast crusades. There's a wonderful spirit in them. It's great singing. I sort of could like it. I do. I like that sort of stuff. But you know what I notice? No one has a Bible. Not a soul. They sit there. There's great humor. 
There's great music. But no one's got a Bible. Why don't they have Bibles? Because they think they know it all. Because they've got some great ecstatic experience and they can roll around and they can shout and do all those things. The most important thing that you can do is to read your Bible and to follow Christ and know the truth. And as I've said to you, like a cracked old record, <laughs> read your Bible every day. Our Father, we thank you for the plain truth of the Bible. We thank you that one day your people, through Jesus, are going to receive the gift of everlasting life. We have it now, but it's going to become a reality at the second coming. When this mortal puts on immortality, and this corruptible puts on incorruption, and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We thank you that the outcome is absolutely, utterly sure. We thank you, our Father, for the wonderful, sweet, precious old gospel. Our Father, open our ears today to hear those words. I want the congregation to repeat after me these words. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And let me respond on behalf of the Lord to you. Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And we all say, Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen.